Welcome everybody to Give Voice Poetry in Response to the Salem Witchcraft Trials of 1692. Tonight, the Salem Athenaeum is partnering with the Peabody Essex Museum in conjunction with its current exhibition. We're presenting three award-winning writers, Mandy Gutman Gonzalez, James R. Scrimger, and Cindy Veach, whose poetry responds to this horrific and lethal time in our colonial history, a time dominated by superstition, fear, and intolerance. Before we begin with our evening of poetry, I'd like to introduce Dan Lipkin, the Anne C. Pingree Director of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum, co-curator of the exhibition the Salem Witch Trials 1692, currently on view at the Peabody Essex Museum and a member of the Salem Athenaeum. Dan. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, everyone. And thanks again, Jen and Jean Marie and JD and the Writers Committee too. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. I'm really pleased to be part of this program and for the next few minutes, I'll give you a brief overview of our current exhibition, The Salem Witch Trials 1692, on view through April 4th. Uh, please note that time tickets are required for entry, and my colleagues at PEM in guest experience, security, and facilities really do an amazing job to make the museum safe and clean, even at this challenging time. I hope you've all seen or will be able to see the show. There isn't much time left. But if not, our marketing team has arranged a 3D scan of the exhibition by a company called Matterport. And we included content such as label texts and high resolution images indicated here by red dots to include for visitors to open and read when digitally navigating the space. And here's what it looks like when you're dropped in at the start, just like Google Street View. That's a great way for those who can't travel to experience the show and this can also live on virtually after the physical exhibition closes. Uh, it's just been added to the Witch Trials exhibition page on our website, pem.org. This is the introductory panel to the exhibition in our atrium. We intentionally begin the exhibition here to indicate to visitors in which gallery it's located. And it was also an attempt to reduce crowding just inside the exhibition entrance. So this is the first major exhibition of this material since 1992 the 300th anniversary of the trials, and it consists of objects drawn entirely from the collection of PEM and the Phillips Library. On display are 19 objects, eight books, and 20 documents dated 1494 to 1855. Now the documents, most of which are owned by the state but are currently cared for by the Phillips Library, are extremely fragile and light sensitive, so we can only exhibit them on select occasions for a limited amount of time. The exhibition opens with a section called Witchcraft from Europe, a portion of which you see on the left, and it briefly covers the European historical background and key religious and social contexts. Four books are displayed here, including the library's 1494 edition of the Malaeus Maleficarum, a foundational European witch hunting manual. Then we bring the context a little closer and invoke the environment of the period in the next section, Salem and early New England. Several objects, including Tompkins, Harrison, Madison's painting, Examination of a Witch, and rare examples of 17th century domestic architectural elements are on view here. The main portion of the exhibition, Intolerance and Suspicion, deals with the complex events of 1692 and 93. The majority of original objects and documents are on display here, roughly organized around groups related to key characters and in their own words. And in this way, we recount the true events of the trials and emphasize the human scale of them. And this helps us connect emotionally and empathetically with the real people caught up in this crisis. The 1692 portion closes with the warrant for the execution of Bridget Bishop. And from here, you enter a reflective space containing a memorial wall listing the names of the 25 innocent people who lost their lives as a result of this crisis. And you see the beginning of that wall here. The initial reactions to the trials are emphasized in a small display of three books published in the immediate aftermath, including Cotton Mather's defense of the trials and Thomas Mall's withering criticism of them. 
And finally, we suggest that visitors continue their journey of learning about the trials and reflecting on them through visits to other local sites shown here. We close the exhibition with a moving and timely quote from a proposal for the 1992 Salem Memorial design by artist Maggie Smith and architect James Cutler. And we hope that visitors will take these words and these concepts with them and make the connections between the injustices of 1692 and those of our own time. So I hope that gives you a sense of what the exhibition is like. I'm grateful for the extremely hard work of the project team. I mean, we pulled this off in, in six months at the start of the pandemic, which is nothing short of heroic. Um, and, and we were fortunate to benefit from the expertise of Tad Baker and Richard Trask, who served as advisors to the exhibition. So I very much hope you have an opportunity to visit before it closes. It's just a couple of weeks away um, on April 4th. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Jen. So thank you for your time and attention. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, yeah, I, I have the honor and pleasure of uh, going through the exhibit. So if you if you haven't been, try to get there before before it closes. It's such a moving moving um, exhibit. Uh, before we start with our our poets, I want to remind the audience that you may post questions in the chat box, and Carolyn and JD should be monitoring that. So if we have time at the end, um, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask the poets. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Mandy Gutman Gonzalez, a poet and novelist from Vilches, Chile, is the author of La Pava from Adiciones and Nuba Calistas, a novel which follows three children who indirectly experience the trauma of the Pinochet military dictatorship in Chile. They won the 2018 Boulevard Emerging Poets Prize and have received fellowships from the Bucknell Seminar for Younger Poets, the Lambda Writing Retreat for Emerging LGBT Voices, the TAC Residency in Berlin, the Center for Book Arts, the Frost Place Conference on Poetry, Latinx Scholar, and Mass Mocha. Their poetry has appeared in West Branch, Diode, Berkeley Poetry Review, The Malahat Review, Boulevard, Bloom, Hobart, and other literary journals. They hold an MFA in poetry from Cornell University and teach creative writing at Clark University. Their current documentary poetry project, Salem Songs, treats the court examination as poetic form, a hybrid of legal language and literal, lyric utterance. I'm really looking forward to that. Mandy. Hello, everyone. Happy spring equinox um, or fall equinox if you're in the Southern hemisphere. I believe my parents are zooming in from Chile. Uh, I want to thank Jennifer Martelli, for hosting this event in the Salem Athenaeum and Peabody Essex Museum for sponsoring the reading. And thank you everyone else for being here. There's people from all times in my life. So it's really amazing um, to see everyone here. I'll read three poems from my manuscript Salem Songs, which uses court records of the Salem witch trials as a sounding board to uncover the power and violence res residing within the language of the legal system. And as Jennifer mentioned in this project, I think of the court examination as a poetic form, a hybrid of legal language and lyric utterance. This first poem is called Sarah Good's Confession. March 1, 1692. From prosperity I fell, twist of wounded falcon become stone, petrified midair. Silver wing flits first and fits fist next. Is tragedy to fall or be born down? Neither seems tragedy reserved for kings. Shame to walk into God's living room for fear I'd be thought ghoul, his throne approaching in cloth so worn, a worm would deem it goody earth, or a garment aggravated by 10 years grave. So, not wishing to be God's fright, I had myself coppice hid. But just as hunger coerces cornered rabbit to wolf jaw, 
I've seen myself around from door to door where bystanders say buys with earth stuffs, rain spit, rain rocks in my direction. And as doors open for their slamming pleasure, I've felt air relax into its shape behind the banish. Ready am I to confess my hunger. Oh God, have mercy on this humble corpse, which flattened low by desperation, partook in the following mischiefs. Myself turned into a rabbit and ate my neighbor's lettuce. Myself turned into a snake and devoured my neighbor's hen eggs whole. Myself turned into a little girl and socked on the teats of my neighbor's cow and drank till full. Myself turned into a ram, mounted my neighbor's sheep and took the extra lambs. Myself turned into a pail and slurped my neighbor's butter as I churned. Myself turned into a goat and ate my neighbor's horse whip like jerky. Thus, I pass my hunger onto my neighbors who call me unsavory, though I taste of their groceries. In this next poem, you will hear two voices, that of the magistrates who were responsible for deciding the guilt or innocence of the accused and the afflicted, those who claim to be tormented by the accused witches. Importantly, what was at stake was never the guilt or innocence of the witches, but the court, because the court had already decided that they were, they were guilty. But what was at stake was whether or not a witch would live, um, whether she might live or be hanged. To live, you had to confess to being a witch and blame others of witchcraft. To live, you had to send others to certain death. In this way, witchcraft was contagious and the court proceedings themselves multiplied witches. In this poem, the accusations of the magistrates are interrupted by a chorus of afflicted who interject with bold but fragmented shards of language that both disrupt and fuel the proceedings. These interjections are in caps in the poem and can be read in columns or left to right, and I'll read them both ways. I'll hold my hands up <laughs> when the afflicted are speaking, um, but another way to tell is that the language will completely break down. Court examination, Martha Carrier, May 31, 1692. You alleged, once a spoiled child, three times a rotten lady, you multiply pain in a rain of pins. Therefore, you, the fruit to be exploded by the wheel of God. Your histories wedge you to your alleged. Born to town's founders, you bore a bastard and married below your station, bringing a sour taste to everyone's mouths. In the grip of the devil, torn. Alleged sipple his full full dis among hate hand. Alleged disciple among his hateful handful. Just as you fell in price tag, so did your soul shed the gold each, each infant is born with. X-ray in your adult soul, we have found it thorough clenched into coal. We must punish those banished from God's pasture. For Lamb of God is not Lamb of the Alleged. Allegedly, they call you colt that walks on front legs solely, hind hooves in the air perpetual with devious kicks. She is colt, walks front solely the who with legs. She is the colt who walks with front legs solely. Returning to Andover, destitute, dragging four children across the mud, your alleged evil swept the town like a smallpox, and upon days of your arrival, 13 persons were dead. We see ghosts, their thunder, the feet, the irk, don't, girt, ouch, ow, in, ailing, and. We see 13 ghosts under the ceiling, their feet don't touch the ground. 
Worse, seven of these were your relatives. Woe, three seeing, ut, woe of the wind in the sheets, knees call o. Oh. Woe, woe, three of these in winding sheets call out niece. Escalate the elegy, escalate the alleged. Now look at you, a rampant hag. She is rampant, rampant, or the hag hang. She is the rampant hag, repent or hang. Each finger points in your direction. Look at these afflicted. They fall when you look at them as if by your instruments. Propagate pain, propagate allegedly. When we fall too as if at held, she have the all us, falls no ground times upward. To the choice with else by ground to her, she stringed so. When she falls to the ground so, we have no choice but to fall to the ground with her as if at all times else, she held us upward by strings. Allegedly, your wits visit them at night and torment them in their beds in the shape of a cloud of bats blindly landing on their hair. Here is wing which I found, bed of a cham, the bat in my burr. Here is the wing of a bat which I found in my bedchamber. What say you to that? Actions speak truth, but words lie. Allegedly, your body in spectral form clapped outside a house, and presently, a cloud of bats clustered through the hole, the clap slapped off the window. We saw our bybats sick her, writing, flinging, evade, blank, the, the amorets. We saw her evade our flinging blankets by riding the bats into the sycamore. Your alleged blood is a stain upon these lands. Thus, we cannot let it cycle within your body more. No, nor through the bodies of your children, which are but faucets of your evil, for the sap of witches runs bitter down the tree and Lamb of God is not Lamb of the Alleged. Shh, E is E, Ram, and Hag. She is the rampant Hag. Therefore, we squeeze confession out of your sons Richard, 18, and Andrew, 15, by experiment tying their heads to their heels so blood rushes out of their noses in a vivid stream which falls upon their eyes so they see their evil and repent through the vision of their plasma. Your daughter Sarah, seven, the little cooperator, confessed she's been a witch since she was six when she allegedly, when you allegedly presented her a book of an alleged red which she touched. Escalate all, escalate the, the egged e elegy. Escalate the alleged, escalate the elegy. Also, a falcon feather in an inkwell wherein she perceived swim blood. We will continue to melt confession out of your children until drops the last drop for the wedge of your alleged keeps hell's door ajar and germy devils gush therefrom to our locale. This final poem is about Tituba who is often blamed for beginning the Salem witchcraft hysteria. She was accused of witchcraft early on and saved her life by admitting to being a witch and blaming two others of witchcraft. Because Tituva was an enslaved person, the only records of her life are the court transcripts themselves. Tituva herself remains a mystery. Even her race is unknown. She is referred to as Indian woman servant in the court records, but she appears in later texts as Negro, half breed, colored, and half Indian, half Negro. Much has been said and assumed about her. 
Tituba has been treated like a wild card, pliable enough to make any argument. In writing her two examinations, I wanted to avoid speaking for her and instead comment on this dynamic and point to how little we know. Short phrases in the poem, three to five words usually are encased in quotation marks to draw attention to the fraught nature of speaking and quoting. So just picture that in your mind. Much, but not all of this language comes from the court records, uh, but it is completely rearranged. Second examination of Tituba, March 2, 1692. I am your acquired taste, nettle, thistle, weed. I am your covenant with the future. Many fine things long agone, accessible through me, extract history through. I am your borehole into many fine things and a little more. Was I ill? Was I taken? Was I ill? Was I ill-mannered? I was born homesick between my thumb and forefinger. I was born borehole, but I digress. This is your book. Must I make a mark? Any paper? The courthouse scribe is a white hand writing the dates in black ink. The devil said some fine thing, something like creatures to be given, taken. A little bird, something like green and white promises, spring boughs. You ask, did they speak to me the spark of witches? I multiply my misery. They were four, they were one, each standing in their cardinal direction. They must meet together, may meet my Mrs. House. They all meet together. I saw them all stand in the corner and the man stood behind me and take hold of me to make me stand still in the hall a good while, fast forward to the point. They all looked on, see me pinch the child in my own person and all the rest, the company watching a great or little book. Did you sign it? I did, didn't, not yet. Yes, I did. My so-called mistress, mistress, set my name to it but tomorrow I will hurt them again, nor have I ever done so, not me, in your story. Did you sign your name? Not yet. Did, did he get it out of your body? A great many marks set my hand to it, which is a knot of women, a yellow bird, a sleight of hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you uh, so much for your reading. James R. Scrimger is pro Professor Emeritus at Western Connecticut State University. He has published 10 books of poetry and a critical biography of Sean O'Casey. His most recent book, Voices of Dogtown, Poems Arising Out of a Ghost Town Landscape, Loom Press 2019 was listed as a must read by the Massachusetts Center for the Book. Today, Jim will be reading excerpts from the title poem of an earlier book, The Root and Other Poems from Pike Staff Press. Jim, thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I will be reading excerpts from The Root. Uh, a long poem in which I retrace the route in modern day Salem that my ancestors, Mary Town Este, took when she was hanged as a witch in 1692. Witchcraft was hung in history, but history and I find all the witchcraft that we need around us every day. Emily Dickinson. Browse through the trinkets on sidewalk tables, the witch mugs, witch buttons, witch postcards, witch bells, 
and take a parenthesis to tell the shopkeeper who asked belligerently, hey, what are you writing in that notebook? That you're keeping a record of the journey as you retrace a journal, as you retrace the route my great, 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 great grandmother took with seven others on the back of a jouncing cart as it lurched from the jail for the fourth and last time to Gallows Hill on September 22nd, 1692, that you're interested in a contrasting view. Why don't you put in the which pennies while you're at it, he says. Okay, which pennies, three for a dollar. Through the which city t-shirt, Salem, a bewitchingly good time, reads one. Neglect to mention Thomas Perkins, juror, who sat in judgment of the accused witches, Thomas Perkins, 1659 to 1722, whose blood is also coursing in my veins. Rest on the stone bench at the busy intersection of Essex and Washington. Watch the water of the fountain pour out of the five holes in the large rectangular stone slab. And think of the sign right there in the window of the Zodiac Room, which features Salem witches, psychic readings, magical gifts, and Diana, an internationally known psychic who has clients in all parts of the US and Canada, who has worked with police in the investigations of murders, and who employs psychometry, tone vibrations, and past life regression. Diana, who does the utmost in her powers of discovery and detection. The stone slab, a large gravestone with ghostly figures carved into it. The water streaming forth like five men urinating. Look, that one there, that puny stream, the oldest, needs prostate surgery. Walk through the middle-class residential neighborhood. Check out the old New England houses on both sides. Pause. Press your face to the wrought iron bars. Look through the black shop pike fence at the dry black fountain on the dry brown lawn. Look through at the Salem Public Library at yet another red brick building. Red brick, a modern Salem motif. Listen to the hubbub, the confused tourists holding up traffic, the herd, the horns blaring, the word asshole floating in the air. Think of all the innocent blood that will be shed, which cannot be avoided in the way and course we go. Sweat profusely in the heat. Pick up the pace, pass quickly by the grace Episcopal Church, the Quaker Meeting House, and the shingle, Stephen B. Hayes, psychiatrist. Arrive at the intersection with the statue of Joseph Hodges Choate, statesman, lawyer, patriot. Wonder, any relation to the Choate School? Wonder, what do you have to do to be a patriot? Call to mind. Recite Mary Estes' petition. The humble petition of Mary Estes unto His Excellency Sir W. w. Phipps and to the honored judge and bench now sitting in judicature in Salem and the reverend ministers humbly showeth that whereas your poor and humble petitioner being condemned to die, do humbly beg of you to take it in your pious and judicious consideration that your poor and humble petitioner, knowing mine own innocence, blessed be the Lord for it, and seeing plainly the wiles and subtlety of my accusers, cannot but judge charitably of others that are going the same way as myself, if the Lord steps not mightily in. I was confined a whole month upon the same account that I am now condemned for and then cleared by the afflicted persons, as some of your honors know. 
And in two days time, I was cried out upon them and have been confined and now am condemned to die. The Lord above knows my innocence then and likewise does now as at the great day will be known to men and angels. I petition to your honors, not for my own life, for I know I must die and my appointed time is set. And the Lord knows it is that if it be possible, no more innocent blood may be shed, which undoubtedly cannot be avoided in the way and course you go in. I question not, but your honors does to the utmost of your power in the discovery and detecting of witchcraft and witches. It would not be guilty of innocent blood for the world, but by my own innocence, I know you're in the wrong way. The Lord in his infinite mercy direct you in a great work, if it be his blessed will that no more innocent blood be shed. I would humbly beg of you that you would be pleased to examine these afflicted persons strictly and keep them apart sometime. And likewise to maybe try some of those confession wishes, I being confident there are several of them has belied themselves and others as will appear if not in this world, I am sure in the world to come, whither I am now a going. And I question not, but you'll see an alteration of these things. They say myself and others having made a league with the devil, we cannot confess. I know and the Lord knows as will shortly appear, they belie me. And so I question not that they do others. The Lord above, who is the searcher of all hearts, knows that as, as I shall answer it to tribunal seat, that I know not the least thing of witchcraft. Therefore, I cannot, I dare not belie my soul. I beg your honors not to deny this, my humble petition from a poor, dying, innocent person. And I question not, but the Lord will give a blessing to your endeavors. Essex County Court Records. Take a left onto Pope Street, start up the incline, judging charitably of others going the same way as ourselves, offering them our arm as we depart from the baseball field, the lower half of Gallows Hill Park. Get short of breath, walking up the three foot wide asphalt path to the top of the hill. To the playground, look up, Read from the town family record. Mercifully, the death of William and Joanna Town occurred before the mad witchcraft trials began. And they did not have to suffer through the trials of their three daughters, which included excommunication from the church and the disgrace and pain of execution. Read the petitions of old Isaac Este, whose life dragged on into 1712. The myriad petitions to clear his wife's name provide, presented again and again to the presiding legislature. Imagine the family's long trek down the winding trail, the eight dark scarecrows silhouetted against the red sunset, the reverend noise, eight firebrands of hell ringing in their ears, poor little words echoing still echoing out the pavilion, the chip paint, the white pillars and black shingled roof. Observe the large juts of rock rising out of the sheer brown sward, the broken glass glittering in sunlight, the small fires on gray slate and packed brown grass, the basketball court well kept up, and a tall flagpole, the stars and stripes streaming over all, over the bare-chested young man sitting on the 15 by nine oblong cement slab, radio blaring. The young man looking out over Salem, the factory with two smokestacks and the new condominiums. Tomorrow, we'll see an alteration of these things. We'll see an empty six pack, a used hypodermic needle and three quarters, three shining pieces of silver. We'll see the graffiti, 
death, storm bringer, but today, the present. Look, look there in the clearing, in the shade, a preschool climber with clean, cool, steel rungs. Look clearly at the landscape after the storm, at the apology of Thomas Perkins and all the repentant jurors who hereby signify to all in general and to the surviving sufferers in special, a deep sense of and sorrow for our errors, for which we are much disquieted and distressed in our minds and do therefore humbly beg forgiveness and do declare according to our present minds, we would none of us do such things again on such grounds for the whole world. And at the end, know that Mary Este, when she took her last farewell of her husband, children, and friends, she was, as is reported by them present, as serious, religious, distinct, and affectionate as could well be expected, drawing tears from the eyes of almost all present. And feel sad if you must, not for Mary Este, who could not, dared not belie her soul, but for Stoughton and all other re unrepentant judges, the patchwork of their sea of spirits stretched across the rungs, drying as long as words last. And for ourselves, our countrymen, our race, our species, for how little we have learned how little we have accomplished, not for Mary Townesty, the self-forgetful, for for anyone else who has as the searcher of all hearts knows, only love, no trace of bitterness in the heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, that was wonderful. Cindy Veach is the author of Her Kind, Kevin Carey Press forthcoming in 2021 in the fall. Gloved Against Blood, also from Kevin Carey Press, named a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize and a must read by the Massachusetts Center for the Book and the chapbook Innocence from Nix's Mate. Her poems have appeared in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, Agni, Michigan Quarterly Review, Poet Lore, Diode, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of the Philip Booth Poetry Prize and the Samuel Allen Washington Prize. Cindy is co-poetry editor of Mom A Review. Cindy. Thank you, Jen. And um, I'm just gonna pull up my poems. Thank you to the PAM and the Athenaeum for this amazing uh, evening and such an honor to read with Mandy and James. So in 2016, after living in the Salem area for about 24 years, I was cutting through a side street in Salem and I stumbled on the Salem Witch Trials Memorial. And it was kind of like a portal for me or an epiphany, if you will, um, realizing that each one of the names inscribed on the stone benches was an innocent human being who'd been murdered. Up until that point, I had succumbed to the witch kitch narrative of modern day Salem. I decided to write a poem about each of the 20 victims. And it was important to me in to incorporate in those poems texts from the trials and the depositions. Uh, my main source was the University of Virginia Salem Witch Trials documentary, documentary archive and transcription project. Um, so the victim poems did become a chapbook called Innocence and then morphed into a full length uh, manuscript forthcoming in October. I'm gonna share some of the victim poems tonight and some other poems related to the trials. The first poem is called Umancy Triggers Witch Hunt. Umancy is divination uh, by using raw egg dropped in water. And one theory suggests that Umancy may have triggered the witch trials. Um, some of the girls that ended up being accusers were dabbling in it. Because albumen in water shape shifts, becomes bells, fingers, spires, becomes omen, a future husband, his occupation, 
but also unexpectedly a specter in the likeness of a coffin, a sign of diabolical molestation. Elizabeth and Abigail fell into fits. Barking like dogs, complaining invisible spirits were pinching them. Therefore the afflicted, therefore the accused. I should mention that um, in the printed poems, the text is italicized that comes from the trial. So you can probably hear it because the language is, you know, archaic. This next poem is called Spectral Evidence. And spectral evidence refers to witness testimony that in which the accused person's spirit is, um, provides evidence of guilt. Uh, the, the accused person's physical body does not need to be at the location. And this was accepted in the, in the courts during the Salem witch trials. Spectral evidence. Because she said she saw, and therefore, these pinholes in her skin, on one arm to be exact, Look how they crisscross, make a doily of the flesh. And because she said she saw you, not you, take a small pin from your pocket, a straight pin with a flat head. And because she said it was, it was, therefore you, therefore not a dream, puncturing each pore, you and the flesh, not flesh, with a common pin. Rebecca Nurse, hanged July 19, 1692. At first the jury returned not guilty, to which the judge said, retire and reconsider the not. After all, she had not answered the question she had not heard. Guilty of being hard of hearing, maybe mouthing what? Guilty of having a temper, arguing with neighbors. Guilty too of piety, 39 attesting to her deep devotion. Still, the afflicted swore it was her apparition that did the pinchings and prickings of their flesh. And in court, when she raised her arms, the afflicted raised their arms. And when she inclined her head, the afflicted inclined their heads. Uh, Elizabeth Howe, hanged July 19, 1692. Uh, Elizabeth Howe's husband was blind and she had to um, do most of the work around the farm and the home. Elizabeth Howe. I had to be my husband's eyes, the light that could not reach them, leading him about by the hand, tilling the land my father gave me, running the household. And for this, they would not let me come into the church of Ipswich. And for this, they said I bewitched horses, cows, sows, and was the cause of sorrows that killed the pearlies, little Hannah. No, never in all my life. I saw I had to be the husband, eyes, mouth, muscle, and took the lead and hanged for it. So a total of 14 women and, and six men were executed as part of the witch trials. Um, and this next poem is a found poem. Reasons you might have been accused of being a witch in 1692. You are a woman, you are middle-aged. You have an extra nipple, mole, freckle, or basically any other mark on your body. You stumble over your words. You have an extra nipple, mole, freckle. When asked to say a prayer, you stumble over the words. You are married, but don't have children. When asked to say a prayer, you are the envy of other people. You are married, but don't have enough children. You associate with someone suspected of witchcraft. You are the envy of other people. You are perceived as bitchy. You associate with someone suspected of witchcraft. Your milk spoiled. You are perceived as bitchy. You are of low status. Your milk spoiled. Or anything vaguely negative that happened to or around you. You were of low status. You have any mark on your body. Your milk spoiled. You are a woman. You are middle-aged. Martha Carrier, executed August 19, 1692. 
They said she brought smallpox to Andover. They said she killed her father and brother, making her a queen in hell, AKA landowner. Neighbors testified it was none other than Goody Carrier who haunted them at night. They said she bit Sue Sheldon, threatening to cut her throat because she wanted her to sign the book. She stuck a pin in Dumb and Putnam, killed Samuel Preston's cow for being very lusty. And there was that black man whispering in her ear, somehow she caused the death of Alan Toothaker's cat. For these complaints, though each one was a lie, she was condemned by the grace of God to die. John Willard, August 19, 1692. John Willard married Margaret Wilkins, third generation Salem village, the first in her family to marry an outsider, which made his in-laws wary. She was third generation Salem village. He bought 500 acres and sold them off, which made his in-laws angry. He spoke out against the afflicted girls, bought 500 acres and sold them off, refused to round up the accused, condemn the afflicted, hang them, they're all witches. Refused to round up the accused, condemned Anne, Mercy, Susan, Abigail, hang them, they are all witches. When Margaret's cousin fell ill and died, Anne, Mercy, Susan, Abigail said, they saw the apparition of John Willard before Margaret's cousin fell ill and died. He was 37, no one came to his defense. They swore they saw the apparition of John Willard. She was the first in her family to marry an outsider. He was 37. No one came to his defense. John Willard married Margaret Wilkins. If you confess to being a witch, you would be spared. Uh, you would not be executed. Um, Samuel Wardwell um, initially confessed to being a witch but he could not live with his guilty conscience for having lied. So he um, confessed that he was not a witch and therefore was executed. Uh, Samuel Wardwell, September 22nd, 1692. This poem is a sonnet and it is almost composed entirely of, of text. Constable Foster of Andover said, this Wardwell told him once when he was young and discontent. He was foolishly led along telling fortunes with the devil's tongue, which sometimes came to pass and confessed he was baptized by the black man at the Shawshin River alone and dipped all over because he was in the snare of the devil. He'd see sin in their hand and then he would cast his eyes down upon the ground. He signed the book with pen and ink the devil brought he says he made a mark like a square. They took it down from his mouth, but he said he belied himself. Also said he knew he should die. This last poem is titled At the Threshold. It incorporates text from the entryway to the Salem Witch Trials Memorial. And the designers of this memorial uh, approach the idea of injustice through four words, silence, deafness, persecution, and memory. And for deafness, they inscribed the historical protests of innocence on the entry fresh threshold, and they slide under the stones of wall, sort of in mid-sentence. At the threshold, slabs of worn stone inscribed, for my life now lies in your hands. Gray slabs that do not touch. On my dying day, I am no witch. Where their words slide under. If I would confess, I should save my life. Mid-sentence, I do plead not guilty. Before the mute tombstones, God knows I am innocent. Where the Taurus mill, I am wholly innocent of such wickedness and pose for selfies, O oh Lord, help me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you so much. Um, 
So I just want to thank all three uh, readers, Mandy, Jim, and Cindy, for sharing such well-researched, um, well-constructed uh, work, um, just very moving. And I think uh, all of the poems just underscore the relevance of the Salem witch trials um, today uh, because they exist in our world. And just, I was looking at the, um, the chat box and seeing so many people who have, uh, you know, our descendants and Jim's poems, um, you know, it, in one way or another, they've been touched by, um, by the Salem witch trials, by the tragedy um, of the Salem witch trials. Uh, okay, so I have not been looking for questions, but JD or Carolyn, um, have you been monitoring any? No, uh... no questions yet. Right, I haven't seen any. I actually have a question which if, if that's okay, if I can jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, again, as I say, I just the, um, the research that all three of you uh, have done for your poems, I mean, it's just so evident. But what I'd like, I mean, as poets um, and as pe people who work with language, I mean, I, I love the uh, mingling of found poems, you know, the, the transcripts from the trials and the, you know, the, the great imagery and the great language. That How did you, I don't know, I maneuver, you know, rhythmically in a poem? If that, does that make sense uh, for, to when in your braiding, um, you know, how, how, how are you able to do that and keep the, the sense of a poem going? Uh, and I, it goes to all three of you. We can just go in order. Mandy, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I started by, I was just kind of playing around with this, the language of the, the trials, um, the University of Virginia Salem Witch Trials Documentary Archive and Transcription Project. They have a website with all of the trial documents there, which has been really useful, especially during the pandemic, <laughs> when it's hard to actually visit the archives. Um, but I started out just by reading through and picking language that jumped out to me as particularly evocative or that um, for whatever reason I was reacting to strongly. Um, so doing a kind of erasure process, copy and pasting that information, those phrases or sentences into a document, squishing them together into a block, and then methodically going through and, and usually completely changing um, all or the majority of the language um, to accentuate certain sounds um, or play with imagery. Um, I One thing that really influenced me was uh, reading Cotton Mather's sermons, especially um, The Wonders of the Invisible World. Um, and I was struck by how strange the, the metaphors that he was using, how, how fiery and strange the metaphors. So I was trying to replicate that um, with my own language. Um, and there are moments of uh, anachronism in the poem, as you might have heard, uh, because I'm trying to think of, of linkages with the present moment. Um, but yeah, it was a process of, of erasure and then completely um, changing the language so that almost everything was different. The, the one exception are the two Tituba poems. Um, and those do recycle mostly the language of uh, the examinations, but they do so in such a way that where the language is completely rearranged. Thanks so much. Jim? Yeah, well, I, I think the main thing that I want to say is that the, the, the walk turns out to be the organizational principle as I retrace the route from the jail to the gallows hill, uh, that that sort of gave my 
uh, coherence to the whole project. Of course, I have already done a lot of the research in Phillips Library right there across the street from Pam, and that I had, and the, much of that research is there in, in the poem, especially the Marytown Estee petition, which I tried not to change a, a, a syllable of that because it was so moving and so powerful when I read it that I said, if it affects me this way, if I, it just has half of the effect that it has on me on a readers, then it's going to be a great poem. <laughs> and I, I think that that turns out to be the case. Definitely. It's such a moving uh, piece. Cindy, um, I, the question goes to you. And then I think Becky, um, we can actually merge it into, because Becky asked about the, uh, the uh, UVA project. Um, and, and Mandy mentioned it as well. Uh, it, she, uh, Becky was wondering, Cindy, if you were ever able to go there in person, but also the, the question to you also with the, the found language. Yeah, well, I did end up um, using some formal forms, really. I, I, there are several sonnets in the collection and um, pantoums. And it was just, um, you know, depending on the, you know, kind of Mandy spoke, you know, you read so much of the testimony, you, you, you read and read and read and certain things hit you, certain things pop out, certain words and and then you kind of follow that lead and some many of the poems ended up in sonnet form and you know other you know one's just like a block one is a um sort of an erasure so it really was a matter of getting to know the subject whichever person i was writing about and then kind of what felt right for that particular poem um and yeah, that the the University of Virginia site was just invaluable. I mean, I read a lot of books, but that was just really what I used the most. And it's it's just chilling because you can read every deposition, every word. It's it's just phenomenal. And they've done an incredible job of digitizing and transcribing every single bit of testimony. So and it's just there for the public to to access. It's amazing. Were you ever, did you ever go down? Were you ever able to go down and see it? See what? The, did you actually ever go to University of Virginia or did you do everything online in terms I of- I think it's all digital. I don't know that they actually have. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a digital repository. That's great. Um, there's a question also to Dan about the withering rebuttal text you mentioned. Uh, Jay and Becky both were asking about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's, uh, these readings are fantastic, by the way. Thank you all so much. It was really uh, a real pleasure and honor to be with you on the program. Um, yeah, so the Thomas Mall publication, it, it's titled Truth Held Forth and Maintained, and it goes on for a long way as many 17th and 18th century book titles do. Um, but Truth Held Forth and Maintained is the beginning of it. It was published in 1695. I actually typed 1700 there initially, but just a few years after the trials, it was the first rebuttal of the trials to be published under its own author's name. So he really went out on a limb here. He was very brave and courageous by putting his own name to this text. He had to publish, had to get it published in New York because nobody in Boston would touch it. And he was jailed. Um, for slander against the, the Puritan government, and he eventually he was put on trial. The amazing thing about his story is that he was actually, he, he was a Quaker, so he was not liked by the Puritans, of course, and he was put on trial and put in front of a jury that was mostly Puritans, a few Quakers sprinkled in, and he was acquitted. And uh, Tad Baker at Salem State, the, you know, witch trials expert, um, he thinks that this is really where the freedom of the press and freedom of speech begin because he was critical of the government and he got off. So we think it's a it's a really, really important book in the context of the witch trials and in what happened um, eventually, you know, a century later in America. Dan, do you want to say a little bit about what the... Uh, what the Phillips Library has in terms of 
collections. Uh, I know that my my dad uh, he wrote his poem quite a while ago, back when the the Phillips Library was across the street from the PEM. Uh, and but just because people have mentioned the Virginia um, archives, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if you want uh, wanted to say a little bit about what else is in Raleigh. Sure. So um, the, the Phillips Library is now in Raleigh at a state of the art collection center about 15 miles north of Salem. And we um, we take care of about 550 documents from the Salem witchcraft trials. It's the largest repository of those documents in the world. Uh, Mass Historical has some, the, the state archives has some. The majority of those documents are actually owned by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and they were put on deposit with the Essex Institute in 1980. And so we still take care and provide access to those documents. And, you know, we're really, really fortunate uh, to have that situation in place. And, you know, um, we're really, really thrilled to get this, this stuff out and on view. Um, there will be, PEM is working on a reinstallation of their American art galleries. There will be a permanent component of which trials documents in that, which I'm, I'm glad to say. And I, Probably shouldn't say this yet, but I'm working on a, a fall exhibition of witch trials materials, something a little bit different. So, um, you know, we're very fortunate to have these objects and documents in our possession. And, and um, in some ways, it's this exhibition is something that we only really we can do because these objects are in Penn's collection, the canes of George Jacobs, a chair that belonged to the Englishes, and et cetera. So thanks for the question. Any other questions? I have, I actually have a question for the poets. Um, spelling in the 17th century is interesting <laughs> to say the least. So I wonder if, if, you know, in the reading it's one thing, but in the writing, do you, is that something that you have in mind as you are kind of crafting the, the words and the phrases that you're using? Because there are, you know, misspellings galore and, and various ways of spell. Even Elizabeth's How Elizabeth Howe's last name may or may not have an E on it, that sort of thing. I, I can answer that. Um, yes, I definitely play with spellings. I actually have a document where I write the old spelling and the newer spelling um, of the word so that I can keep track. And then I uh, search in the document and change those words. Um, and I also think a lot about syntax and the way that that kind of wrenches the language differently from the kind of conversational speech that we use today. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thanks. What I, what I did, I, I kept the language of Mary Town Estee almost exactly as it was in the transcript. Some of the other quotations were quotations from books in which the town family record, for instance, in which they had made some changes in the spelling and language to bring it up to date. So I just copied their language and brought it up to date too. So that's that's how I handled that issue. Um, where I've included the text in, in many of the poems, it is verbatim. I've left the spelling um, as it is. That was important to me. You know, there is one thing that's, it doesn't quite sit right with me, but any, the devil is always referred to as a black man, black creature, black pig. I feel a little awkward about that, but it is verbatim from the text. So when you're reading the printed, it's in italics, but when I read it, it's, um, I just, I've struggled with that a bit and what I should do about that and if it's okay or not. But uh, that is the way the devil was portrayed in, in the 1600s. That's right, yeah. Yeah, if you've ever read any of uh, Ibram Kendi's work, there's a, there are some passages in the beginning of his book, Stamped from the Beginning, where he talks about that very thing and how the racialization of, of the devil um, was, a, was a device, you know, was very intentional. Okay, Cindy, end it. If there are no more questions, say good night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I want to, uh, before I ask everyone to unmute and, and give um, Cindy and Jim and Mandy a round of applause, I just want, I want to give my thanks to uh, Dan Lipkin, just, uh, that was a wonderful PowerPoint and just the exhibit is, is stunning and I really hope you do um, have something in the fall again. Uh, thank you, Mandy Gutman Gonzalez. Thank you, James R. Scrimger. Thank you, Cindy Leach. Thank you, Salem Athenaeum and the PEM. Um, and could everybody unmute and give the poets a round of applause. I'm, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Amazing evening.